we are recording lectures that means so we take online class and do the recording and okay. uh, then uh, we used to share with the students oh, okay yeah that's nice okay and uh, you know previously we used to take offline classes and uh, you know bulk of students uh, come uh, and we are having classrooms and uh, okay. the teaching was different and uh, now uh, we used to sit uh, at one place and then we have to prepare a presentation and deliver a le lecture and uh, right. yeah, it has both where we had a uh, white i mean digital boards introduced so okay. when digital boards were introduced in uh, you know offline classes that was a huge huge mistake for us because we never understood teachers were not able to write on the board when it came to math courses and then all of a sudden when i graduated i heard that classes are now online so it's kind of surprising how even the education industry went entirely online be it schools or universities or whatever for work agreed uh, you know people are ready but education is a completely different uh, uh, game world to handle yeah uh yeah kritika yesterday we are having a session on open source and data science and right. uh, you know when i uh, asked the speaker uh, that uh, what's uh, what's your opinion about uh, online and offline classes uh, mm -hmm. she, uh, she said that uh, sir uh, we can prepare uh, with online classes also but moreover we got time to uh, go for internships trainings and uh, uh, other uh, other things also which we are not getting during the offline class that means we have to go to the uh, college and uh, as per the industry demands now the things has been changed they are not uh, industry doesn't means that you are having 8 or 9 cgp in your uh, uh, results they also need uh, what project you done uh, what internships you have uh, cracked and uh, you know the things has been changed so she said sir this is okay sir online classes is okay and yeah. uh, it it should be uh, and i am also thinking that uh, in the future prospectus uh, we might be having uh, i guess 60% offline classes and 40% online class that's what i am thinking there is no uh, 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 you know something uh, a circle came but i was thinking that it it may happen yeah i mean definitely true uh, again like you said uh, you know i mean uh, industry is now placing importance on the projects uh, the internships that you've done not like you have to do great internships but whatever you have done you have to be clear about what you what you have done and you know the concept you know it in and out as long as that is there you are hired and they don't look at your cgp unless it's extremely low but otherwise i think that uh, point about having a great cgp is no longer there in any of the universities it's more like a filtering criteria and uh, it's more about how you present yourself and your skills that is becoming important day by day So uh, yes, I am looking forward to interact with all of them. Hopefully, help them out in places that you know I felt a little confused when I was in college. So that is probably my main motive for this uh, uh, session. So yeah. All right. So today we will be talking about cyber security. This is our second session on cyber security. We did one session yeah. on cyber security, <laughs> and. Uh, host Anamika and Somi are here. Uh, please greet uh, Gitika. Hello, ma'am. Nice to meet you. Hi, same here. So, hey, ma'am. Hello. Hi, Samia. Nice to meet you, ma'am. Same here. Ma'am, that you are a student or a fourth year student or a fully graduate one? I graduated on twenty uh, twenty. So, post that, uh, I joined EY. Uh, uh, for my full time experience so internship plus work experience would be around more than a year little more than a year so uh, probably a recent graduate in your terms yeah mom which type of internship means can you please uh, give a brief detail about the internship okay so regarding the internship uh, i joined as a cyber security intern uh, for ernst and young so ernst and young has a, a sock center so a sock center is basically where you you know monitor different companies and uh, it is it is kind of like a center where everyone uh, just makes sure that you know companies don't get attacked or there's 24/7 monitoring going on for you know the different clients so um it's it's highly equipped uh, in fact uh, ey's uh, chennai sock center is one of the best in india 
um, probably I would say in my terms, it is the best in India. And uh, they were the very first ones to uh, come up with the SOC uh, setup as well. And uh, it being in a location like Chennai was something very different and uh, it is a big hit basically. Uh, so when I joined the internship, uh, I would say that the team was mid-sized and uh, they were still looking for uh, skilled, uh, uh, not just skilled, but rather uh, people who are willing to learn uh, new technologies and learning to adapt to the different requirements because you know this industry is ever changing. Uh, today there is something that would uh, you know be in trend and then the next day it's gone. So you have to be ready to learn each and everything at any point of time. So I joined as a risk analyst. I mean, I joined as a cybersecurity intern first, and uh, I did different kinds of work. Uh, you know, uh, I had the opportunity to look at uh, different. Uh, types of uh, uh, work that is present in uh, the cyber industry, which I will be going through my slides. But um, that was a very good learning period for me because I felt that I learned more in that internship than I did in the past four years of my college. So that was a very, very uh, good experience, pretty challenging, but uh, uh, it was a pretty good experience. And post which I got converted full time. And since then, it's been a roller coaster ride and I'm absolutely enjoying it. Um, Ma'am, how many internships you had done before? Means like in your engineering in uh, all four years? Okay, so I actually don't have a count. So uh, if I have to put it in a good answer, I was a, I was the kind of college student who was willing to take each and every opportunity that was in my plate. So I was into web development. I was into security internships. Um, we had clubs and chapters for which I was creating websites. So there was a time when I had like 10, 11 web projects in my hand, a full-time course load and uh, a multiple internships. One, I had worked in a startup in college itself. So it was quite a lot, but uh, I do realize now that all of it was not necessary. Uh, and uh, uh, if I have to see, put it in terms of a number, I would say around 10 to 12. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes to relevant to the field, I would say around four to five. Nice. Um, Ma'am, I am a first year student. I am also just uh, looking for the internship. I hadn't done any internship till now. So, Ma'am, uh, can you please guide me how I choose means which type of internship uh, should I do in my first year? Uh, in your first year, I would really uh, you know, tell you to just uh, explore the different subjects in class. Uh, you don't have to do an internship in first year itself. I would say second and third year is the right time. Probably after your first year and you have a SEM break, that is also a great time. And uh, uh, I mean, you would have different subjects uh, that you have in classes. Uh, pick up a field that you think you're interested in. And uh, but if I have to uh, tell you what are the you know most booming uh, trends, I would definitely say cyber is one one uh, end. I mean, companies are still in the lookout for uh, graduates. There are still heavy requirements. You know, they don't even want skilled professionals. They just want out of the college uh, students who can, you know, really uh, adapt to the environment. Second would be data science, uh, analytics. That is, again, another booming world and very much required in the current situation. Uh, and then um, you have your good old, good old uh, software development. So that is always going to be there, no matter what. Uh, no matter how much AI comes into place, you will always have your coding that needs to be, you know, that's always a booming industry in today's world. Um, but uh, again, uh, coding is not everyone's cup of tea because I I did four years of computer engineering. I was into coding, but I was just wasn't happy with the way uh, things were thought. It was just more like uh, learn three, four languages together at once. And uh, maybe because of that, I lost my interest in coding, but I am like uh, getting into it again. But uh, the point is, everyone thinks that only if you become a software developer, you're you are going to have a good career, your salary is going to be really high. But that's not it. There are various other industries as well currently that are still looking for uh, a good professional. So I would just say, take your first year to explore the different subjects that you have. And you're probably starting with the basics such as a database or fundamentals of coding and things like that. If you're in the computer, uh, uh, I mean, computer engineering uh, domain. And uh, whatever your field is, just explore your subjects in the first year. Second year, pick up one a particular domain. Try to do a lot of self-learning, uh, paid courses, projects, whatever you want to do. 
but make sure that you know your domain very well before you apply to internships you there's no point in blindly applying to internships that's not going to work out uh, uh, having that skill set at hand and uh, is is very important before you apply to internships okay mom thank you mom you mom yeah. your domains explain me in very well way it helps me a lot i will explore the thing and now yes. i was thinking like do i will do the internship and then uh, uh, choose a domain but it is like it is wrong i think yes like i said i was into web development uh, i took web development even though i know i don't want a career in it i simply took it because i thought okay it's going to help me if i go for masters but i realized even though if i mean even if i'm going to apply for masters i'm not going to put it anywhere in my resume because it is not relevant to my field so having a uh, field relevant experience is very important obviously you might have one or two internships it's going to be outside your uh, you know interested field but apart from that uh, uh, you know i maybe i do regret that i could have used all that time in, into you know working my skill set for the field i want because right now the internships that i've done uh, most of it i'm not mentioning it anywhere in my resume because it is it is not relevant to me so a uh, field relevant experience is very important um, try your best to get internships in the field that you're interested in even if you don't it's all right but uh, you know uh, having that focused goal and uh, uh, you know building your skill set for that particular uh, domain is important and obviously you will have to know all domains as well but uh, if if someone or if an employer sees you that focused that you he sees that these are the different skills that you have learned for this domain these are the different projects and internships that you've done that is going to catch their eye immediately they, they know that you are a person who knows about this field and they know that uh, they are not going to regret hiring you so that is very important okay we need to bring a domain yes so mom let's start the session uh, so good afternoon all of you gigzi welcomes you here for the today's session of our future in digital career opportunity in cyber security today we are having gitika gopi ma'am as a guest speaker and today we will learn about cyber security so now i would like to welcome you ma'am to start the session gitika ma'am yeah sure uh thank you anamika for the introduction uh so i'm sharing my screen and then we can begin after that yeah is my screen visible Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Okay. Right. Uh, so, thank you all for joining the session today. I know today is a Sunday, and I know how much a Sunday means for a college student. But uh, I'm really glad to see all of you here, uh, uh, wanting to learn more about this uh, field. And I'm very much happy to share my own experiences and thoughts on uh, cyber security. So, I would be definitely talking about the domain itself. but uh, apart from that i would love to interact with you all if you have any further questions about how you can get ready for cyber security uh, to become the adept professionals that the industry still demands all over the world um just a second i would stop sharing it I'm having trouble with the presentation okay yeah so a brief introduction about myself um, my name is geetika gopi and i primarily identify myself as a security researcher and a risk analyst at ey so before i talk about my role at ey i would definitely uh, you know come back to it in the further slides but apart from that i would like to talk about my research as well as uh, you know my community involvement uh, i am hoping some of it would interest you all and uh, you would have the opportunity to look into it as well so i'm someone who loves to get uh, actively involved in the community so uh, uh, post my four years of engineering i lost my touch with uh, uh, coding even the third and fourth year i i hardly coded and and that was something that uh, you know i had a little bit of regret and uh, um, so uh, me and a bunch of uh, cyber security professionals we started this new project called as python for security uh i would be willing to put a link down to it so python for security is a small knit group of people uh hanging out on the discord channel and we uh, basically uh, you know spend time creating security tools using python uh so until now most of the professionals or rather me we use the tools or you know we probably do scripting or something like that but 
um, you know, in my free time, free time exploring how to create these tools using Python is an extremely different experience and uh, something that you can all explore because I'm sure I was one of the people who never liked the coding in college when they just tell you to code, you know, like a binary tree or something like that or code decision trees. I was pretty bored by some of it. Um, I did not find the point of it or rather, I mean, obviously it is important, but I wasn't interested in it. But when I actually explored Python for security, it was it was actually very interesting. And it is actually not rocket science, something that anyone can do from the first year itself if you have basic knowledge of programming. So Python for security is a project like that. Uh, I'm a member at N2 Women in Networking. So uh, we are again a tightly knit uh, group of women who basically uh, meet every month to uh, have a session on the different research that is happening in the computer networks field. Uh, we talk about the different uh, projects that all of us are involved in, and it is a very, very good group. You have uh, researchers from all over the world and from top universities as well who uh, interact with you. So that is, again, something that you can look at. Uh, I'm a volunteer at One in Tech, uh, so it's an Isaka Foundation. So uh, this 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 focuses on uh, you know helping students uh, get into the field of STEM and cybersecurity. So we mentor students right off the bat from the age of 11 and 12, and we help them get into the cyber industry. And I'm a speaker and ambassador at uh, Women in Tech. So this is again a group that. Uh, uh, focuses on empowering women in technology in, in uh, very diverse fields and making sure that their voices are heard. Uh, when it comes to research in academia, I've always uh, been actively involved in research right from my first year itself. Uh, quite extensively, my most of my research is focused towards uh, security. So, uh, and again, if you look at some of these uh, topics, let's say data mining, digital forensics, NLP, cybersecurity, all of which are basically courses that I had in my college. So I had picked them up as electives or rather it was a compulsory course for us. So it, it's like every or rather courses that interested me, I took up that sub subject and I did a bit of research uh, and I collaborated with that professor to uh, you know do some scientific research and publish a research paper as well. So for example, data privacy preserving data mining. Um, I'm not sure if data mining is a course at university, but it is basically a subject where it involves um, analyzing comprehensive amount of data uh, to look at interesting patterns and interesting insights that you can derive out of it. So uh, that is basically uh, data, data mining. So data mining, um, there is an aspect to it uh, because data mining uses very much critical data. Uh, uh, there, uh, a major aspect of it is losing privacy in it. So um, my research was mainly based on how you can protect the privacy of your data when you're uh, performing all this uh, mining techniques. So that is regarding privacy preserving data mining. Uh, digital forensics is basically a field where, uh, let us say, an individual or an organization or a business gets attacked. Uh, there is a, a fixed set of methodology that you'll have to take before you even start your forensics to find out how the attack happened or um, who is the attacker or where is he from? So it's very similar to um, it's very similar to like a, a police investigation. For example, let's say you have a murder in, at a site, you have to make sure that the evidence is not tampered. You have a set of protocols. You know, you will have uh, the police department going there, filling out a set of forms, collecting collecting the evidence in the most careful way possible. So these are a set of rules that is followed by any investigation process. And the same actually goes for computer forensics as well. Uh, at the moment you know that there's a computer uh, compromise, there is a set of rules that you have to follow uh, to ensure that you know rest of the organization is not affected as well. So it is more like uh, the affected computer, you would immediately remove it from the network, you quarantine it, um, you would carefully remove the hard drive so that you don't lose any important information. And then there is a process to actually transfer it to the analysis lab. So in between also, there is a process uh, you know, in place to ensure that uh, the evidence is not tampered with. Uh, and uh, uh, so digital forensics is something that mainly focuses on the approach. So um, my research is you know, uh, exploring different approaches as well as uh, proposing different methodologies that you can take to ensure that uh, the evidence reaches safely to the site and uh, uh, 
uh, good practices basically to uh, investigate the compromised computer. So that is uh, what it comes to digital forensics. So when it comes to DNS security, uh, DNS is again, uh, you know, your domain name services. Let's say you type google.com and it, it, uh, it actually maps it out to the IP of Google uh, because uh, humans cannot remember all of the IPs, which is why you, we use name websites. Um, and DNS is, the issue with DNS is it's still, uh, you know, uh, communicated in plain text. So uh, there are high chances that uh, attacks happen to DNS servers because you don't have any kind of encryption or security put in place there. So my research in DNS security is, you know, finding uh, AI-based solutions to ensure that uh, uh, these DNS services are secure. Uh, cybersecurity and AI. So this is something that is booming right now and is probably where I see my career going as well. Uh, so uh, even now we have a lot of companies day by day that is taking up artificial intelligence to actually uh, protect companies. Let it be even my uh, organization. Uh, you know, uh, when I entered uh, EY, that was the time when we made the transition from a manual analysis to automated AI-based intelligence solutions. Because uh, we realized that uh, no matter how uh, how many humans you put in in that SOC center to analyze your threats, there is a chance for human error. And when that human error occurs, a small human error can cost billions of dollars to organizations. And we are actually seeing that happen to many uh, businesses. So uh, these AI-based solutions are smart enough to detect the threats um, before it is too late. And it can help uh, tell the rest of the human uh, resources that, look, there is a threat in the organization, look into it and fix it immediately. Uh, AI is not perfect, uh, let it be in any field as of now, mainly in cyber, uh, probably it has improved in other uh, industries. But when it comes to cyber, uh, it, it is still a very, very long way to go. Uh, it is, if we are probably, let's say, at a step one of uh, 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 having AI, uh, you know, as a huge uh, use case for cybersecurity. But again, it is a field with so much potential. Uh, there is so much research going on in the world, how you how AI can completely replace cybersecurity. And especially in today's situation with the pandemic, uh, uh, I mean, your COVID-19 pandemic is on one end, but you also see cybersecurity has, uh, the attacks have spiked, the importance for, of cybersecurity has increased, uh, the need for security professionals has largely improved. Uh, so that is when it comes to AI and cybersecurity. And um, NLP and neural networks is more like um, my niche domain or rather uh, a domain that I was very interested in looking into. So using neural networks is again a type of AI that is uh, researched on to ensure that your AI algorithms are good and in place. <coughs> so any questions when it comes to this? I'm not sure if... Uh, most of you understood, but I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to, uh, you know, clear your questions on the way. All right, we can move to the next slide. <laughs> okay, uh, so I truly believe that the hackers are the immune system of the internet. Uh, if you actually think about it, uh, you know, these hackers, they are in, in a simple word, they are horrible, they are annoying, they are irritating, they cause a lot of uh, losses to government and organizations, and uh, uh, there is just disadvantages uh, at one end. But if you actually think about it, uh, the hackers are a very important part of our world because they actually tell us what are the weak parts in this universe and they force us to fix it. So. Uh, if we do not have these hackers and if we don't know the different kind of vulnerabilities and issues that we have in our world, let's say we blindly uh, uh, come towards uh, or we blindly try to fight these hackers, that's not going to happen because these hackers have a huge power that uh, probably the experienced professionals might not know as well. Every single day there are new attack methodologies created, new uh, you know, phishing campaigns that are in place. Every single day is a new day for this industry, which is why I feel that the hackers are a very, very important uh, uh, part to uh, our, our uh, environment. So, I'm very really sorry. That's my fire alarm. Just give me a second.
is everything okay ma'am yeah yeah it's all right it's just a regular alarm that's ringing it'll be done in uh, two minutes Well, this topic is very much important. If I just uh, talk in terms of computer science students, as Gitika already said, uh, we will be having artificial intelligence uh, in uh, coming future. So most of the organizations are working on AI, and definitely they need to secure uh, their data. And uh, whatever uh, the work they used to do, you no, know, the business thing or uh, anything uh, which they are working on uh, the internet. It requires security. So cyber security is a major concerning uh, part. And uh, if we talk about our curriculum also, we are having cyber security as a subject. Apart from cyber security, we are also having network security. And uh, the basic concepts of security we used to study there, uh, if we talk about the types of attacks and uh, what are the vulnerabilities and uh, what are the solutions, how to encrypt the data, encryption, decryption. Uh, we used to have uh, all such things in our uh, network security subjects also. All right. Uh, I'm really sorry for that uh, interruption. Uh, it was completely unexpected. Uh, so we'll continue. Uh, so like I was saying, the hackers uh, are a very important part of our world. So a very, very short case study. Uh, so there was once the security researcher called Barnaby Jack, and he had hacked the ATMs in such a way that, um, you know, the ATM started throwing money at him. And uh, this technique of hacking ATMs and, you know, uh, taking out all the money is called as uh, jackpotting. So that was a name that was uh, created in the honor of Barnaby Jack. So, uh, you know, people like Barnaby Jack are, are the researchers who force us to look into the uh, critical uh, vulnerabilities in our environment. Because like it goes with great power comes great responsibilities. So these choices that the hackers make actually run the cyber world. Uh, and if you if you're aware of it, there are three types of hackers. We have the black hackers, the white hackers, and the gray hackers. Um, so the black hat hackers, they are definitely the hackers who have malicious intents. Um, they want to uh, misuse the different vulnerabilities that are present in this world for their own greed, let's say money or or anything, or just data itself. Data is powerful every day. And then you have the white hackers. These white hackers are basically, uh, you know, uh, uh, professionals who make sure that uh, uh, our, our environment is protected and we don't have any vulnerabilities that can be misused. So when it comes to the gray hat hackers, they are, uh, uh, they are, they are black hat hackers by the day and they turn white hat hackers by the night. So a mix of both of them is a gray hacker, but uh, these black hat hackers are primarily someone that we have to be very careful about. Uh, so there was a researcher named as uh, Kyle Lovett. So uh, Kyle Lovett was a security researcher who found a vulnerability in um, a, a particular model of uh, routers. So these routers, um, you know, he found out there was a very huge, uh, uh, you know, uh, vulnerability issue where anyone can log into anyone's router in the house and they could like remotely download files that are present in the hard drive. It was a huge, huge uh, risk that was put into all the products he did report it to the um, he did report it to the company but the company did not take his report seriously so what he actually did was he he actually broke into everyone's routers um, whoever had that particular uh, model and he did not steal anything but he actually left a note uh, so let me show you the note that he had left 
So this is a note that he had left in all of the routers. So the moment you open your computer, you're present with this note. Uh, it was saying that, you know, this particular router that you have is vulnerable and you can have the risk of being attacked uh, because of this router. So he even gave them the recommendation of how to fix it uh, and how to protect yourself. But uh, yes, by doing this, he broke the law uh, by getting into everyone's uh, routers and, you know, you know, just having this message there. But by breaking the law, he forced the company to fix that vulnerability. And I don't think that would have been possible if they had just ignored his report and just and he and even if he had gone on with his life. So people like this are the ones that, uh, you know, monitor our cyberspace, monitor, uh, uh, you know, the different uh, uh, technologies that I have in our environment, making sure that they are secure enough. And it is not like most of these security researchers are paid anything or or anything like that. But some of them have this uh, motive that uh, we need to make the world a secure place. At the same time, we have the opposite uh, of them. We have these people who uh, want to misuse each and every vulnerability that we have around us. Uh, it is kind of tempting because if you think about it, what if you had the opportunity to log into your uh, university portal and change your grades? Or what if you could hack into your bank account and add a few zeros into it? Things like this are very, uh, you know, tempting to do. And, and this is where a fine line of being the bad person and the right person comes in. And ensuring at which side you're on is what determines uh, how our cyberspace evolves. So talking about uh, COVID-19. Uh, so COVID-19, uh, you know, at least for me, if anyone says COVID-19, I do not remember... Uh, 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 I mean, more than the, the actual virus itself. To me, I remember how badly that the cyber had uh, cyber world had uh, evolved. Uh, uh, and, and in fact, uh, when I entered the industry was exactly the time when uh, we had the lockdown in place. Um, uh, co the companies and organizations had to move remote. Uh, they all had to work from home. Um, and I'm sure you all did too. Uh, and this entire shifting from on-site to working from home was a huge challenge to organizations and businesses because um, they have to ensure that everyone can, can connect to the environment, uh, connect to their office environment in the most secure way possible. So I'm bringing up a slide. Uh, so this is a slide from uh, Semantic. So this was a survey that was done by them. And as you can see, the top two, uh, you know, uh, the top two points say that most of the work had gone into uh, making sure that the remote employee has computing devices that have been se securely configured. So yes, I do have a company laptop, but there are companies that do not provide a laptop as well. Uh, and and when it comes to then, you'll have to uh, you'll have to work with your IT team to make sure that you can use your home computer to connect to your office. Um, which is again not safe because you never know uh, using your personal computer what kind of I mean uh, do you access malicious websites or is there any any malicious files in your uh, computer that can easily affect the computer network as well or uh, the second point being giving your remote employees secure access to the corporate network so these two points were the scrabble face uh, which is where most of the companies struggle uh, I mean some of them uh, were quick and fast enough to move to work from home, but some of them took their own time. And taking that time to move uh, to the work from home scenario in the most secure way possible, uh, that had its own consequences because uh, we saw a sudden increase in COVID-19 attacks, cyber uh, COVID-19 based cyber attacks for clients. We saw many of the uh, you know big named clients being uh, attacked because of the work from home challenge. Because um, you know if your VPN VPN is basically what you use to connect your office network. So if, let's say your VPN client or your or your endpoint computer is not secure enough, or there are chances for um, there are chances for attackers to hack into your or uh, you know get into your VPN connection uh, to uh, get uh, unauthorized access to the network because. You know, uh, let us say an example. Um, one of the examples that I would have is that there was one incident where for one of the clients, um, uh, there was a username that was being used to connect to the office network. But we saw that there were two people using the same username to connect, and they were connecting from very different locations. So that is also, you know, something that we have to look into. Compromise of credentials, uh, or rather uh, using an uh, unsecure client, or... Uh, 
uh, or let's say uh, having unauthorized access because when you're in office you can physically not have access to a certain uh, asset if you are not supposed to but when it comes to working from home you need to make sure that the right people have the right access to the right computers uh, i mean uh, if there's if there's someone uh, an intern cannot have an access to a very critical uh, asset so things like this if the fine tuning doesn't happen it creates a huge gaping hole for attackers to misuse and uh, thankfully we have finished the first two phases of moving everyone remote but we are still in that fine tuning phase when it when it comes to india and organizations of making sure all our uh, you know all our employees are connecting securely and our uh, environment is a safe place to work so when it comes to covid-19 crimes uh, most of it has been phishing related attacks so phishing is basically in simple words to put it you are being tricked into entering a malicious trap uh so this could be in terms of uh, someone sending you an email uh, that looks like it is coming from your friend someone sending you uh, you know an app uh, but uh, you probably someone random is telling you you have to install this app because it is important for your phone um uh, and let's say even your even someone can message from your dad's email that see i need this this please do this this or let's say you logging into a fake bank account or rather a fake uh, bank website but you don't know that you're in the fake website because everything looks the same so this is basically what phishing is and we realized that there was a huge spike in these phishing attacks during the covid-19 time so even when we were working um, you know with different clients we had to ensure that you know we monitor different emails that comes with the keyword covid-19 uh, or different websites that are being accessed with the word covid-19 or let's say pandemic or coronavirus or anything like that because we realized that um, there were multiple mails going to people uh, for example there was a mail that had come to someone saying that uh, uh, you know the email id looked like the government mail I- email id but there was a difference in the email id and there was a link saying that um, please register here for your free covid-19 vaccine so that was the kind of mails that almost uh, you know everyone fell into i mean i wouldn't say everyone but most of the people fell into because let's say you do get an email from the government you are bound to click it and register or do whatever you want but when that happens simple you're being compromised and and those kind of uh, uh, attacks have increased a lot in uh, in, in during the covid-19 pandemic um when it comes to these tracking apps uh, i think that's quite famous in india right now uh, i remember the very first time the government had introduced our um uh, covid-19 tracking app there was a lot of debate that came in saying that you know it 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 actually violates privacy laws it violates the individual's privacy that is not something that should be done and right yes uh, there it was a challenging time for the entire world to uh, you know help track covid-19 affected patients using technology but at the same time make sure that the privacy is not compromised so uh, there were so many covid-19 fake tracking apps that were present in the play store and uh, they all their simple job was to deliver malicious files to your phones or malicious files to your laptops or any of your mobile devices and uh, uh, phishing was probably one of the major reason why most of the individuals or governments were getting attacked uh, so you know a simple recommendation would be always check um, uh, from whom you are getting the mail from anything suspicious from the mail just don't click it any suspicious message on any of the social media don't click it do not download an app if you don't know that it is secure for sure uh, so the things like this would you know uh, help to protect yourself from these kind of uh, cyber attacks so now when it comes to the different cyber security career domain so hopefully i would have interested you uh, regarding uh, cyber security by now uh, so cyber is again uh, probably a sub domain of uh, computer science uh, but uh, cyber itself has a million uh, uh, sub uh, categories but i would tell you the major ones and the ones that have immense scope So the first is being incident response uh, so incident response is basically the immediate steps you will take once an individual or a computer or or a, a business or organization is attacked so what we would do if uh, a client or anyone is attacked we would immediately receive that particular uh, computer's memory hard drive 
any of the raw data we can collect in the most secure way possible because you know when a computer computer is attacked and if at all a person shuts it down we we lose half the information on it that is something not everyone knows people think that restarting your laptop or shutting down your laptop when you think that something has happened is the right way but that's actually not true in fact when you do that you would actually mess up the malicious file that is present in your computer as well as you lose on a lot of evidence that can be very helpful for you know security analysts to find out how you were compromised so uh, incident response is the very first step we would take of collecting that particular computer's memory and uh, we ensure that uh, we 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 do our own analysis into it and uh, we basically create a reverse map to find out how did that particular attacker enter uh, was it was it a vpn client was it a malicious website was it a malicious email so that's basically what incident response is if i have to put it in simple words it is police investigation but in the cyber world so uh, that is that is a very booming industry right now and probably could interest the many of you next comes uh, application security again uh, this requires no introduction uh it it is basically the different applications that are currently present in our app stores or let's say web applications uh, mobile applications uh these applications need to be ensured that they are secure enough because uh if they do have serious vulnerabilities that's going to affect um anyone for that matter just not just uh, businesses and organizations but even governments for that fact so a lot of time goes into working on the application security before the application is even rolled out for the users use so the next is uh, threat intelligence uh, so threat intelligence is basically us uh, or rather it's a community who uh, works together to protect the world one step at a time let us say organization a has been attacked by a particular ransomware we would collect all the information that they have uh, observed let's say what is the malicious uh, ip that has been involved in this attack what is the malicious emails what is the malicious websites that have been involved in this attack so they would actually create a list of it upload it to a common environment so this is shared with the rest of the world so that we will you know we can continuously check whether we are getting any uh, hits from that particular ips or websites so for example if you do have a particular malware that is you know attacking uh, an organization they are not going to attack just one organization that's that's very rare to happen they are unless it is a particular motive but uh if if a particular malware is on trend that is going to attack uh, that is going to try to attack a lot of organizations so uh, you know if you do see that you know xyz ransomware is in trend right now you can be keep a check on your network to ensure that you are not going to fall trap to that particular ransomware so uh, that is what is threat intelligence curating the different uh, you know different uh, uh, we call it as indicators of compromise iocs uh so we collect the different uh, iocs and uh, make sure that uh, we we don't get any of the hits for any of our, our clients or we don't get any hits in our organization itself and make sure that we are secure and we don't uh, fall trap to that particular uh, malware so uh, next is network forensics uh, it is just a sub domain of digital forensics and uh, uh, like i said networks is also one of the main areas where people try to attackers try to enter through from um simple being your vpn connection anyone can if your vpn connection is not secure or the product that your vpn product or client that you're using is not secure um high chances of the attacker trying to intercept that traffic and uh, uh trying to enter your uh, network or or probably doing an impersonation uh, basically trying to act like it is you but it's someone else on behalf of you doing activities so that that's what happens when you know network attacks place takes place so uh, network forensics is just a sub domain of digital forensics so sim monitoring is just the, is probably the major service that my sock is providing the sock i'm working at is providing now so what we do at sim monitoring is we have a couple of tools uh, we have a couple of sim solutions some of it some of it that are uh, quite famous is splunk uh, qradar so these are sim solutions that most of the companies are now famously using and uh, what they basically do is they collect logs 24/7 from real time uh, logs 24/7 from uh, the client's environment and we have a set of analysts who work 24 by 7 and they look into the logs and they make sure that there is nothing malicious happening so the moment something malicious happens we immediately have to you know tell the client this so and so is happening please look into it immediately 
So that is one of the major service that um, you know SI, SOC centers provide. That is twenty four seven SIM monitoring. So vulnerability assessment and penetration testing is commonly called as TVAPT. Is basically just you trying to see whether you are able to break that particular system or are you able to break that particular technology that you have created uh, because uh, that is more like testing to make sure it is secure enough and uh, so that uh, in future you don't uh, you know get attacked because of that particular uh, software or uh, technology that you have created so when it comes to malware analysis uh, it is basically analyzing the different malware so let us say uh, abc malware is on trend right now so what happens in the cyber uh, domain is we have these famous organizations like recorded future or anomaly so these are basically threat intel organizations what they do is if they do see uh, you know a, a famous malware on trend a recent example is red echo i'm not sure how many of you had uh, is aware of it red, red echo is a particular malware attack that uh, has recently been targeted towards the power sectors of india by the uh, by a malicious group in china so because of the border tensions between china and india we realized that uh, there are groups that are uh, uh, trying to attack india in, in you know in in the technology way uh, take, taking the technology route so we realized that whenever the uh, i mean with analysis we realized that whenever the border tensions increase between china and india uh, there is always a spike in attacks that are coming towards india and red echo was one that was uh, mainly attacking the power sectors of uh, uh, power sector of india so what happens during this time is um, one of the research group from from the famous threat intel organizations or any of the security research group they would actually analyze the malware and they would create a detailed report of it uh, and they would post it online uh, or sometimes on demand but they would post it online and they would you know uh, tell the different organizations that see this is the malware uh, this is how it enters this is how it typically enters the environment and these are the evidences that it would you know leave and go so uh, this can actually help us in the future let us say that i do have someone who is compromised with this abc malware and if i have to see you know how he had uh, just to find out how he had entered my network i can simply go or look at the malware analysis report and i can look at the different pivot points that are present and i can uh, do that particular uh, comparison and analysis to find out whether is it the same for my compromised uh, individual as well so malware analysis is a very very interesting field and something that you can definitely look into uh, cryptography i'm pretty sure many of you would be aware of it uh, and uh, that involves uh, uh, creating different encryption algorithms to make sure that your data that is transmitted uh, is is done in the most uh, secure way possible and security architecture is of course uh, making sure that the uh, architecture that you create for your uh, organization or even at your home uh, because most of your homes would be would be having a router or you would have some of them even have antivirus installed in all of your laptops so that is basically security architecture and when it comes to different organizations uh, planning that particular architecture and ensuring that you have your right firewalls in place you have your right antivirus solutions in place uh, and uh, you make sure that there's no back door that an attacker can use to enter in simple words it's you building a castle that is you know secure enough that is what is uh, security architecture but again these are the major domains in security but if i actually have to tell you how many domains there are this would be it and uh, it's obviously not possible to look into each and uh, each and every one of them but i would definitely uh, encourage you guys to uh, uh, you know probably have an overview and try to explore more about these uh different domains so a very common question that i get asked is what can i do to you know get a job in the dom cyber security domain without experience without prior experience because this domain is somewhere where experience matters a lot in fact you if you go if you go tell someone that or let's say you are applying for a, a senior position you go show them your masters degree in cyber and then you say that i don't have work experience but i have a masters degree in cyber security they are not going to give you the job in fact degrees are not uh, actually given more importance to in this industry your work experience matters way way uh, more and in any security certifications as well because like i said uh, technology is evolving especially in this domain and ensuring that you are on the front end and learning the most recent uh, trends is what is important 
so for you guys let's say first year to fourth year if you do want to enter this field and uh, you know establish a career in the security domain some of which uh, you know you need to ensure that you do so the first one is uh, to make sure that your computer networks knowledge is strong so this is something that i've seen in each and every organization let it be even mine uh, so when when we we are looking for interns or we are looking for professionals uh, or let's just say fresh uh, you know graduates from btech we are actually making sure or rather we don't want them to know much about security but we need to make sure that their basic computer and networking knowledge is strong so um, i would say the very first step you have to do is make sure that your knowledge in networks is strong and then apply to cyber security internships or uh, jobs because um, let it be placements or off campus placements the the very first question or the set of questions that you're going to be asked is based on computer networks they are not going to start off with uh, uh, cyber security questions very very basic but otherwise they would just ask you questions like explain the tcp ip model explain the osi uh, uh, you know the, the software layers so that is very important that you make sure that your networks are in place um so there is uh, you know a video course by professor messer on youtube uh, so professor messer is an absolutely uh, engaging uh, uh, you know lecturer who who puts in this very very uh, easy to watch videos 5 5 minute videos but they give you an in depth into the uh, various uh, uh, the various aspects of computer networking and uh, he does touch up on the security aspects as well in fact uh, for most of my internships if i do have to sit for an interview i would binge watch this uh, lectures on youtube and you will be confident so steps 2 3 4 are additional uh, would give you an extra edge but i would say if you nail point 1 you are good to go for a, a career in cyber security as a fresher so a uh, step 2 would obviously to explore the different security electives that are present in class or online so uh, i'm sure you would be having some cyber security courses or cryptography computer network courses so these can help you learn more about that particular field and uh, and that is something very important before you can even start working in that domain so i knew cyber security in depth when i actually took up these courses otherwise it it will not give you that basic foundation otherwise and uh, you have station x courses so station x is a non profit organization uh, that creates courses online and uh, you can look into it a uh, very very good courses uh, you have courses for python and security or let's say um, uh, uh, vulnerability assessment and penetration uh, testing very easy to go courses uh, you would just need a laptop and they would actually tell you how you can build a home lab and uh, uh, easy to follow and and i would say uh, you know if you have a completion certificate from station x that would really help with your resume so the third is being exploring security research with professors because uh, i very much remember for one of my internships i got a call and they asked me what is your practical experience in cyber and i went like i never had the opportunity in college because we had coding labs we had projects but we never really had any uh, resources or you know uh, specific uh, projects that were assigned to us to do in this cyber field we did not have the kind of labs as well so another way you can improve your resume is by create uh, by uh, involving yourself in security research and i'm sure that you would be having professors who would be willing to work for you in this as well so it doesn't have to be anything complicated it can be very very simple it can be a comparative study of the recent trends uh, or it can be you trying to propose something new and all of it is considered security research and that can really give you an edge compared to others and i think most of my um, knowledge and learning had come when i uh, you know did these four years of security research um and uh, and i'm sure you guys would have the best professors to guide you as well into this so it's not like uh, you would be completely jumping into the ocean uh, you will definitely have the guide of your professors and uh, uh, fellow teammates to uh, go ahead with your research uh, community involvement is something that you can do uh, and uh, that is uh, something like participating in ctfs uh, these are capture the flag events where you know you would have a hidden sec- a flag in one of the uh, a point and your uh, job is to it's kind of like a game to break the different gates and go capture the flag and how you break that is by using your security skills uh, bug bounty programs are very famous now uh, and these are basically companies that are uh, telling uh, the world that you know sh- come show me a vulnerability in my uh, product or my network or come show me uh, you know uh, 
uh, a gaping hole that I have and I will pay you money. So that is what is bug bounty. And in fact, bug bounty rewards are quite, quite high. They are paid in dollars and they are very, very good uh, uh, rewards that are being given to people who find vulnerabilities for organizations. So threat intel volunteering is something that actually as, uh, you know came up uh, the past few months due because of the pandemic. Um, the the threat intel community was not having enough people to uh, do research and find out the recent trends. So they actually put up uh, advertisements online saying, you know, we want volunteers to come help us uh, to find the different uh, IOCs that are uh, present in this environment because of COVID-19. And uh, such volunteering activities, if you actually contribute to such a huge cause of uh, helping to protect the different organizations, that is really going to help with your career in the future as well. And open source contributions, I'm pretty sure you guys have not known uh, or had uh, sufficient sessions in the past. Uh, but uh, you can do that in the security domain as well, uh, because most of the products that are being develop developed um, in GitHub, you do find products. And uh, you will see that there are so many um, requests uh, to ensure that the product is secure enough. So that is that is where you can do your security related contributions. Or let us say, let us say even documentation. So I have worked with some of the open source uh, contribution for documentation, ensuring that uh, you know uh, the security, best security practices are in place, and uh, uh, need to make sure that uh, whatever that you're downloading from GitHub and you're installing is done in the most secure way possible. So that is uh, with respect to community involvement. So I'm sure even if one or two of these points that you 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 try to nail. Um, any of the organization in, in, in India is going to welcome you. And uh, they because like I said, the demand is extremely high and we are still on the lookout for uh, really good uh, professionals in this uh, field. So uh, that's it from my end. Any questions uh, from yours? I'm uh, more than willing to answer. If anybody is having any question, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Ma'am, I'm Ma having one question. Yeah. Ma'am, how we can learn hacking like uh, is uh, learning coding in any language or what is the path to learn hacking? Okay, so hacking is a very, very generic word. Uh, but uh, if you want to learn, uh, I mean, if you do want to learn about uh, hacking or let's say penetration testing, uh, like I said, Station X courses are great. Uh, they actually teach you hacking there. And uh, we have Cybrary, which is also great. And uh, so uh, they would, I think they would mostly use this operating system as Ka uh, Kali Linux. Uh, so most of the courses are based on that. So Kali Linux is an operating system that has most of your security tools installed in it. So uh, you'll find most of these courses working with Kali Linux and providing tutorials on how you can use these tools. But uh, uh, I think these courses are more than enough to, uh, you know, get a uh, in-depth uh, learning for uh, hacking and obviously once you enter, enter the industry and uh, you do gain some experience you're going to go for certifications and things like that uh, but uh, as a college student I think uh, Station X courses and Cybrary courses are uh, extremely good to learn that okay. ma yeah uh, ma'am can you tell us something about the open sources that you have discussed uh, in the field of security researches and cyber threats? Uh, you mean the volunteering opportunities or just open source contributions? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so the volunteering opportunities, uh, I would actually probably uh, send your professor some of the links. Uh, that is something uh, many of the um, uh, you know organizations are, are in the lookout for volunteers. So it's something like they would ask you to uh, do uh, research about the recent trends that are happening uh, in the cyber world, or like I said, indicators of compromise. They would ask you to collect the different uh, uh, malicious IPs that are present, the different... Uh, malicious email IDs that are, that are coming in day by day. And uh, they would basically just need your help in curating and all this information. Because, you know, imagine a very powerful platform where you have all your uh, 
IOC is in place, all the recent trends in place, all the malwares that are uh, in, in trend. If you have that in one place, I think that is major power for anyone in the world, be it any large organization or small organization to protect themselves. So I can simply take that information and just make sure that, or let's say even me, I can just take that information and see if whether, you know, I'm accessing any of these websites or by chance is anyone in my house accessing such websites by mistake. So um, that is the power of, uh, you know, the threat intel community. And uh, a simple Google search would uh, show you that there are so many opportunities. You would just probably have to uh, register for it and they would get back to you. So they are not even looking for anyone with uh, prior experience, but rather just passion to contribute to the uh, threat intel community. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Any other questions? Um, Gitika, uh, I just want to know that uh, we, we usually, uh, we usually uh, install the applications of the software without reading the privacy policies. As you already uh, said that during COVID-19, uh, yeah. there are uh, various applications uh, at the Play Store that uh, who uh, used to perform some phishing attacks or any other kinds of attacks uh, related to privacy or security, something like that. So uh, how to differentiate or distinguish between these applications? OK, so uh, the first thing is, uh, I'm sure most of the very common uh, softwares, let's say you're installing Adobe Reader or something like that, uh, these you don't have to worry about. Uh, I mean, even me, I wouldn't look into the privacy of privacy policies of Adobe Reader because I know they are in place. Uh, but when it comes to installing uh, you know, mobile applications, so that is where I would pay attention to what kind of uh, what kind of uh, permissions am I supposed to give for that application? So you will see unnecessarily, uh, you know, a game would ask for accessing your uh, contacts, or a game would ask to access your uh, messages. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, I mean, any good kid would just uh, click yes and install it. But you know, legally they are not wrong because they put that as a privacy policy, and you have accepted to it. So uh, that is something you have to pay attention to when you're downloading mobile applications. And when it comes to uh, on the internet applications, there are so many people that are downloading crack versions now uh, because uh, the actual legal software is expensive, which I totally understand. But you need to know that when you're downloading these crack versions, there are chances that it is malicious. And you would not know it until you actually download it. So there's no uh, indication that uh, you know this is this is a fake one, or uh, it might look like it's the right application, but uh, probably in the back door it is doing something malicious. Or on the other hand, to be on the safer side, just make sure that you have your antivirus solution in place, because these antivirus solutions, to an extent, they would block any malicious uh, softwares that are coming in. Uh, do a monthly regular antivirus scan to your entire computer and uh, always have your antivirus on uh, so that even if you're accessing the different websites or you're downloading various files or let's say even for education purposes uh, you're downloading all these files or uh, softwares your antivirus would catch it if at all it is a common one but apart from that as well i would say just keep on a lookout for what you download uh, just make sure that it is something that is uh, you know verified and uh, if not if you're downloading uh, downloading a crack version just try to avoid it or if you still do, keep your antivirus in place um, and uh, do a regular antivirus scan. I think that's the most important when it comes to protecting your uh, uh, endpoint from uh, multiple attacks. Thanks, Kitika. Welcome. Any more questions, students? Uh, Mom, may I ask uh, one question apart from the cyber security? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Mom, I viewed your LinkedIn profile. Uh, Mom, there is one thing TEDx in VIT. Mom, how this works? Yeah. Actually, I was new. To this. Okay, uh, right. So TEDx is basically uh, you know a speaker community. So uh, uh, TEDx is something that uh, uh, different universities in India have their own. It's kind of like a club or chapter. So uh, we call in uh, very fam We call in speakers from all over the uh, country to, you know, if they have something inspiring to tell, we would invite them for a talk, and we would have like a two-three day session uh, 
that is uh, uh, in our university. So it's TEDx that is not exactly TED, but it is a subsidiary of uh, the uh, TED organization. I'm sure you would see TED Talks all over the internet. So, uh, and different uh, colleges have it. I'm not sure if yours does, but if you don't, then uh, I would I would encourage you to go and try to uh, get a TEDx license uh, created for your college. And you can actually conduct, uh, you know, uh, events for uh, your university. So uh, it is basically a platform to call in, uh, uh, you know, talented people or people who have done great things, but their voices are not heard. So we do call in such speakers uh, uh, and we would organize it. So I was an organizer for that uh, uh, organization and uh, I mean, organization, uh, organization, organization, volunteering, uh, then advisory board. And uh, that's what I did. But otherwise, uh, it is just a, um, a speaking platform. And uh, uh, I'm, I would encourage your college to look into it as well if you're interested. Mom, is this linked to the main TEDx, like American yes, Talks? That it, is, the it, is, it is linked to that. In fact, before you conduct every event, you have to get uh, a license from TED. You have to apply for the license by mentioning what kind of speakers you're going to call what is your overall budget for the uh, event and uh, and and getting that license approved is not easy in fact we did not get it approved for so many years in between because you have to submit the right documents and uh, uh, so it is very much uh, uh, under ted the one in the us and uh, you cannot conduct a te conduct a tedx event until you have a license from ted means college have to apply for the license uh, pardon could you repeat your question? Mom means college organization has to uh, apply for the uh, license. We as uh, a student cannot apply? Yes, as a student, you can apply. But uh, in that case, you would have to create a team. Uh, and uh, you would have to require a professor who is leading that uh, particular uh, uh, chapter. And on behalf of your professor, you will have to apply for the license. OK, ma'am. Thanks for answering. No problem. Um, one Gidea, more thing. Uh, 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 Gidea, can you please uh, write some uh, certification courses related to cyber security or network security? Okay, so, so these uh, certification courses, if I have to be very honest, uh, the industry certifications are quite expensive. Uh, if I have to say, uh, I did a certification called as Network Plus when I was in college, and uh, the exam fees for it itself was close to uh, 60,000 rupees. And if you look at even more better certifications in the industry, those goes up to one lakh, two lakh rupees. So these certifications are mainly sponsored by your company. So I would not suggest you spend so much uh, amount on a certification like that. But uh, I mean, if as a fresher you want to go ahead, I would uh, you know uh, look into uh, Station X courses. Like I said, I could type it on the chat box. So Station X, all of the courses are extremely good, not too expensive. And they teach you the same thing. So Station X is good. Uh, like I said, Professor Messer, his lectures are good. And then there is uh, Cybrary.it. Those are paid courses as well, but even these are good. Uh, but, uh, but apart from that, the actual industry certifications, I don't see a point for university students to do it. Uh, like I said, it's expensive and it's something that your own uh, company would uh, would uh, sponsor if at all you're working for uh, the cyber security team. But yes, these three would be the good ones currently. Uh, I, I wouldn't uh, prefer Coursera courses. Those are not too great. Uh, they will probably teach you a lot of theory. But if you have to actually have hands-on Linux-based uh, um, experience or Linux-based uh, uh, you know uh, uh, environment to work on, uh, Station X courses are great. They would uh, they would actually work you through it, and they would tell you how. So by the end of the course, you will you will you will, you would have created like ten security tools using Python. By the end of the course, you would be very thorough in using uh, Linux and its uh, various commands. Uh, but otherwise, I wouldn't prefer courses like uh, from Audacity or Coursera or something like that. All right, uh, Gitika, one more thing. Uh, as we are talking about the open source contributions, uh, so basically um, there are uh, too many contributions uh, and, uh, you know, we are having repositories and um, something like that. So if uh, the students or some uh, someone uh, will, uh, you know, install the files on their system, 
because as we are promoting open source also so yeah. uh, how, how does it affect you know how can we differentiate again there is a question that uh, this is an open source this is a repository and uh, this repository is on uh, you know very famous site and we are downloading the files from that particular site so you know uh, how how can we differentiate that this is uh, secure or unsecure right uh, so when it comes to uh, github and the various repositories that are present uh, first of all uh, if at all it is malicious uh, you would you would find people uh, you know going against it there is not going to be a repository present online that is going to uh, simply not give any information and you would not download such files in fact i would suggest if you are downloading a repository ensure that there is proper documentation for it documentation is something very very important in github so even for me even if i post a five line code tool if it's a tool that has only five lines of code i would actually create a documentation about what it is how to use it what is the impact of it and make sure that and that is what everyone's working on creating better documentation for uh, uh, for uh, for open source contributions even in our environment we use a lot of open source contributions if we want to automate something at work we use a lot of these open source tools that are present online but we ensure that the documentations are in the right place i wouldn't simply go download it from a random user who has just uploaded the code but you know hasn't given any documentation about it so uh, uh, that way you will have to be careful but again there is very less chances of something malicious being in github they would have security vulnerabilities but there would not be anything uh, any malicious uh, files available on uh, open source contributions uh, okay gitika can you please uh, just a brief about cyber crimes okay so when it comes to uh, cyber crime so uh, i am pretty sure you know that uh, in india we don't have a cyber crime division uh, i mean as much as when it comes to countries like us and uh, and and i think there is a bill being pa passed in the government as well that we do have to create uh, uh, you know proper uh, division for cyber security um, cyber security related crimes so uh, cyber crimes are more like uh, cyber attacks itself but on governments and organizations and uh, they could be like i said of of various uh, uh, possibilities and uh, data breaches is something that is happening recently so uh, what people usually do is uh, you know they would they would uh, hack a particular website government website uh, and recently there was a aadhar card uh, data breach where millions of aadhar card details sensitive information was posted online by a hacker and this can be misused in any way because let's say you register to a website with a password that password high chances you are reusing it for every website so let's say i get your uh, i get your uh, facebook password high chances that's going to be your gmail password or your bank password uh, because we have as humans we have the tendency to use the same password for each and every website and uh, and also recently this covid related uh, attacks when it was happening when covid related cyber crimes were happening we realized that uh, a lot of the medical industry was being attacked uh, especially the um, biotech companies uh, companies that were creating these covid vaccines covaxin and uh, there there were so many uh, uh, labs uh, let's say dr lal path labs uh yeah, and uh, in fact that was something that was largely involved in our uh, environment for sock center uh and so many of these uh, uh, companies that are creating covid vaccines we saw them getting attacked uh, quite regularly every day they were being targeted by hackers from russia uh, the united states china because uh, it's simple everyone was running towards the race of creating a covid vaccine and uh, everyone wants to stop india from doing that and they did take a cyber route which was quite shocking and quite impactful as well because um, when it comes to uh, 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 dr lalpath labs they had recently announced that they have been attacked because uh, some of their uh, sensitive information was present in a public aws bucket and uh, aws services have to be secure uh, so uh, all of the information of whether a per person is positive or not their covid results Uh, all of it was available online now uh, because they did not pay attention to that particular vulnerability and uh, that was all of it was posted online by a hacker he tried to tell the company that look you have this vulnerability they did respond but they could not give a public statement because uh, 
it was a huge data breach imagine i mean imagine your medical records being available uh, in the public and then you have the dark web so the dark web is uh, you know if if you if you consider a, a iceberg uh, the tip of it is what we are browsing using google and yahoo but the majority of the iceberg is actually the dark web so these are uh, accessible via browsers such as tor and you have so much illegal activities going on in the dark web uh it's called as the underworld where you will see a lot of the hackers uh, uh you know hanging out you will see a lot of illegal activities being done there uh, uh terror recruitments are terrorist recruit recruitments happening there you will find guns being sold at a very very uh, normal rate uh so uh, in fact it i would recommend no one to just uh, try to get into it because it's quite dangerous but we do have uh, you know licensed tools using which we would try to access the dark web but uh sometimes i do a simple search for let's say i did a simple search on my name i did find some leaked trench credentials in the dark web uh, and and it was the right password that was available in the dark web not like it's going to compromise me in any way but if it all i had used that password somewhere else i could have been compromised so uh, it's pretty surprising i'm sure right now there are 40 14 people in the uh, chat if i type in all of your names in the dark web or all of your email ids in dark web i am going to find results of com- uh, leaked credentials and that is 100% sure so data breaches are very common uh, happening every single day so it is very important that you change your passwords uh, protect yourself from these crimes and obviously when an organization has a data breach and you are a victim of it they would definitely uh, make a public statement about it and and they would tell what they are doing from their end for example uh, for one of the uh, covid uh, research labs once they were attacked uh, and they realized that uh, uh, you know they are in the bad hands they shut down the operations for one week there was no covid uh, covid vaccine research going on there was no operations taking place one week of delay in our pandemic situation uh, in, uh, you know for creating the covid vaccine is a huge delay and and that was exactly what the hackers wanted they wanted to stop them from creating the covid vaccine and uh, they wanted to stop india being the first one to create it and uh, at times it did they were successful companies had to close down for one week in the in the light of these cyber crimes so uh, it is quite risky and when you are in the other side of the cyber uh, probably working in the industry you will see the amount of data breaches that are happening uh, the amount of very famous companies being attacked and uh, uh, so yes it is even for me uh, even in one year also i am not used to it it's kind of surprising to see these different uh, huge huge companies being attacked or let's say recently there was there is a pdf viewer called as nitro pdf viewer which almost everyone uses uh, these days they had a breach attack where all of the uh, usernames and credentials was uploaded to the dark web and sometimes even laptops are uh, access to laptops are sold in the dark web so there is a chance that the access to my laptop is being sold for 100 dollars in the dark web and i would not know about it so uh, you cannot go into the dark web to actually make sure that you are secure but you can do everything that you can at your end to ensure that you are secure so that is uh, with respect to cyber crimes and you see a huge huge uh, increase in the uh, attack spike these days especially after covid yes uh, well kritika uh, we were uh... taking classes on zoom and uh, as you have already told that uh, this thing happened uh, at the dark web so uh, we heard a news that uh, uh, whatever the meetings or uh, we are having discussions on zoom uh, it is also been available on the dark web yes yes that is very very much true and uh, uh, which is why even in our office uh, we have put a set of rules where you know when we talk to clients we say that we are not going to talk to you via zoom Uh, approved uh, tools are microsoft teams uh, but okay for education purposes doesn't make sense but zoom is actually being used for uh, you know uh, families communicating as well during this lockdown time so it is quite surprising that uh, you know zoom had that kind of a vulnerability but uh, but again uh, i am sure it is fixed now so zoom is back to being secure again but yes there was a time when zoom was not secure and uh, we did receive a warning as well that Uh, i think uh, the country also received a warning that you should stop using uh, zoom and use uh, alternative uh, video conferencing uh, solutions so zoom is one of it but it is because it became famous because everyone everyone was using it uh, for uh, conferencing during the covid time but uh, we need to understand that there are so many 
tools out there that are still vulnerable and uh, which is why it is important to use very much of approved tools let's say microsoft teams google meet uh, such tools you know for sure will be protected um, i mean it's not guaranteed but to an extent yes uh, zoom was a sudden hit people went behind it they realized it was not secure they came out of it and then the company was forced to fix it because they realized it is important for their own uh, profit as well and uh, it is back to being secure now so yes like i said uh, i'm sure that if i do google or if i put in a search for all of your names on the dark web i'm going to find comp compromised credentials that is for sure it could be expired credentials it could be changed credentials which is why it is important that you change it regularly and you ensure that uh, you use approved tools i would suggest even in universities you need to have a set of rules as to you know these are the approved conferencing tools these are the approved softwares that you have to use um, because if you don't then there's always a risk of being attacked even in the education industry uh, um, we have universities abroad i think recently yesterday i read a news about a particular university was was attacked uh so it's not like the hackers would leave the universities as well because they know that's going to stop operations and cause a huge impact so even universities are being targeted uh, these days uh and uh, for them data is important let it be in any form data is, is going to give them power and uh, uh, so they they take any any chance to uh, and get critical data out of it and they would try to misuse it uh, between uh, people and there was also recently a time when uh, Uh, some people from the organization got a mail saying that you know i know all the secrets about you uh, i know what you have browsed online uh, so you better pay this much amount in this link and there were people who actually paid the amount because they were scared about what was what kind of a secret does the guy have when in reality he did not have anything he did not hack he simply sent a phishing mail to everyone and people did fall victim to it and even in my company we have many of these phishing drills where they would randomly send uh, an email a phishing email just to test whether people are secure uh, i mean they aware enough and you will see that 70% of them still fall for that uh, phishing emails uh and uh, that is why it is important that um, not just organization level even at university level security is being very important uh, day by day oh, well this is dangerous yes it is yes Okay. Uh, thanks, Gatika. Any more questions, students? I think they have no more questions. Is any of um, you have I interested any of you in this field as of now? I'm not sure if it was too much to take in at once, but. definitely a field worth that you all should uh, look into because even i do get so many requests now that do you know anyone who you can uh, you know who you think is skillful enough to enter the organization and i wouldn't have names so uh, i would still say that companies are in hunt for people uh, with good uh, well, think, uh, i just want to ask whether if any of the student want to uh, do some internships or training at uh, your company is is there any possibility Yes, it is possible. Uh, I, I can uh, definitely refer. Reach out to me. Uh, just make sure that you have the skill set possible, so that obviously once I uh, submit your profile, they are going to do a resume scan first, and then decide to select or reject you or have further interviews. So, uh, if if you think you're ready for it, then uh, just uh, you know, uh, 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 ping me on LinkedIn or send me an email, and uh, I'll be more than willing to uh, provide that opportunity if I can. thanks kritika um, so host anamika and somya uh, please you can uh, for the last words to kritika yes sir yes sir sure a very thankful to you ma'am that you have given your precious time for us and you have shared your experiences and the initiative which a student and a beginner may take to make up their way and i would like to thank all the participants for attending the meeting and to all the people to our guest speaker to nirmal gaur sir and everyone who directly or indirectly make up for this meeting thank you so much ma'am and uh, we would like to have some more sessions with you uh, with your experiences sure uh, i just wanted to tell a thank you to all of you uh, thank you to nirmal sir as well and the hosts and the participants for joining in here today 
uh, this was a very brief session try to give as much as overview and uh, probably a little bit of awareness as well um, so probably to uh, interest you guys into this field and you can, so that you can explore this field further so hope it helped yes ma'am it helped a lot welcome Uh, thank thanks. you ma'am for a wonderful session and my all doubts are cleared from your session and ppt thanks for clearing my doubts and hope uh, we will have more session further sure definitely uh, thanks kitika for guiding us and uh, yeah as yeah as uh, the students said uh, uh, definitely we uh, will uh, again request you for uh, further uh, sessions and uh, just to make us aware about uh, how secure uh, cyber security uh, is going to uh, you know yeah, for the future trends and uh, yes obviously uh, you are told about uh, so many things here so we need to be aware of all such things as we are uh, moving towards uh, the digital platform more so definitely uh, it will uh, be help a lot and we have to count each and every steps at how we should uh, to move for, uh, further exactly yes definitely okay, Okay uh, so thanks getting again uh, thank you all students uh, have a good day thank you thank you everyone